panel of uh, of today. I hope you have been enjoying the sessions uh, so far. The panel is about uh, leading in the world of uh, uncertainty. And with me, we have uh, eminent uh, panelists joining us for the conference. And I would like to welcome uh, Charumati Srinivasan first. She is the VP of Engineering Microsoft. Uh, we fondly call her uh, Charu. Charu, thanks, thanks for accepting to come to speak here. So Charu is the site leader for the growing uh, cloud and artificial intelligence organization at uh, IDC Microsoft. She's an engineering leader for Aju, responsible for compute engineering uh, section. During her three decade career at Microsoft in both US and India, she has demonstrated engineering excellence, innovation, and strong organizational leadership. She has delivered innovation in many areas, including database replication, server virtualization, data production, disaster recovery, migration, modernization, and hybrid uh, management. Charu is currently responsible for exploring new technology directions and articulating a long-term technical vision, creating value for her business, developing effective engineering processes, partnering with key stakeholders to build a strong internal and external brand, and recruiting and mentoring uh, growth talent. She is a passionate and intentionally intentional about uh, creating a culture of inclusion and has led numerous efforts to attract, develop, and retain talent at uh, Microsoft. And no wonder we knew Charu from Grace Hopper Conference as well. So Charu holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from uh, Anna University and a uh, master's from computer science uh, uh, with the University of California, Santa Barbara. She is on the board of the Confederation of Indian Industry uh, National Committee on Technology and helped create the founding vision for CIS Center of Excellence on Digital Transformation. She has provided the vision of the Microsoft Wise Mentoring, where tech leaders at uh, Microsoft volunteer to mentor women in uh, computer science and software engineering. Welcome, Charu. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, I would like to invite Guru Bhatt. He's a vice president, customer success platform, uh, general manager, PayPal India. He has over 25 years of experience. Guru has been instrumental in driving PayPal's technology strategy in India as the company builds out the next strategy, next generation uh, payment solutions and services. In this current role, Guru leads the technology centers in Bangalore, Chennai, and Hyderabad, and also leads the product management and engineering teams for PayPal's omni-channel platform. Since joining PayPal in 2015 as the general manager of the Chennai Technology Center, Guru has held several engineering and product leadership roles, including transaction orchestration and planning, merchant data products, dispute resolution experiences, and led the development of PayPal's domestic product in India. He holds a master's uh, degree in computer science from the State University of Univers University. At Happy to have you here. Uh, I would like to next uh, welcome Ram Kumar Naren. He's the Vice President, Technology and Managing uh, Director of VMware India. We call him Ram. Ram is, uh, uh, he leads the strategy and growth for VMware's largest global center outside the headquarters, which is Palo Alto, USA. Uh, this includes working closely with the company leadership on portfolio management, talent strategy, positioning of VMware as a leading uh, organization in India. He serves on the board of directors of VMware Software. He also serves on NASCOM's Executive Council and is the chairperson of NASCOM Product Council. Focused on data-driven digital product innovation, spanning consumer and enterprise markets, his expertise lies in product development, product management, and product marketing. An experienced engineering and business leader, Ram has played the role of a technology advisor to both large and small enterprises across the digital transformation, product strategy, and product marketing landscapes. He also brings in a wealth of experience leading and growing global development centers that deliver future-ready solutions. Prior to joining VMware, Ram served in the global leadership positions at eBay, Yahoo, and Microsoft. He began his career in the US auto industry, developing software solutions for design and packaging of automotive suspension and powertrain systems. His work involves digital transformation led by customer journey, managing product development organization, software product management, and product marketing for consumer and enterprise products, and new development in emerging markets amongst others. Ram holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Anna University, Chennai, and a master, uh, master's degree uh, in mechanical engineering and an MBA from University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Welcome, Ram. And I would like to introduce the panelists. Uh, the, the, these three folks are the panelists, and the moderator is going to be Sudhir Sudhakaran. 
So Sudesh is a senior engineering director at uh, VMware. So he works um, on the division which is modern applications and uh, management. He's a site leader for VMware Tanzu India. He is a senior director. As a senior director, he is currently responsible for Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, Tanzu Edge portfolio, leading global teams across India, US, EU, and other regions. Tanzu is VMware's modern application platform portfolio that enables development and uh, operation teams to work together in a new way that deliver transformative business results. Prior to joining VMware, he was the leading. He was the India managing uh, director and product in integration business head for the French cloud provider OVH. A warm welcome to Sudesh and a warm welcome to all the panelists. I think we can get started right away. Thank you, uh, Lakshmi. I think that was much of a longer introdu introduction. So thanks for doing that. We were hoping for a shorter one. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, uh, whichever part of the world you are. I know this is sort of a very diverse crowd. So we are really hoping to make it very interactive. So feel free to post your questions in the chat, and then we'll have Lakshmi helping with that. Uh, especially for the folks in Bangalore, I'm really hoping uh, rains have settled down and then you all are kind of you know safe uh, in the other side of the world especially in the south we are all good but i'm really hoping the other side of the world in bangalore you're all good great so maybe let's get started uh, i think you all heard from lakshmi about the panelists we got a great set of you know panels here so let's get the best out of having this great leaders here so welcome uh, uh, charu uh, guru and ram uh, so let's get started so maybe you're thinking uh, I think it's it's kind of we all kind of relate to a uh, pandemic as like an uncertain world now, but it's it's beyond that, right? I think it's like the MA is there are like economic slowdowns, there are like technology transformation. There's got a lot going on. So I was thinking maybe Ram, it may be a great opportunity to get started with you, kind of trying to sort of define like you know, what do you define it an uncertain situation, right? Do you have a personal sort of a framework? Uh, or a playbook that you use typically to handle such situations. So would you like to sort of kick off? Thanks, the yeah, it's a good topic. I think um, uncertainty is actually increasing. It's not decreasing. I think, uh, you know, while, while we, while we uh, it almost seems like while we finish dealing with one, next one comes up and maybe more. I mean, everything from what you just started, which is saying, hey, you know, suddenly there is a flash flood and sorry, you know, your home is disrupted and everything else to, you know, your work areas and you know, all the other things that go with. So I think the, the def I don't know how to define it, but my definition would be to say where you don't have a control of it. I mean, there are situations that you're put into where it's not of your creation, uh, whatever it is, and you have to figure out a way to either deal with it or, you know, the, the fight or flight is a natural, natural instinct for most animals, including human beings. So I think the, you know, the way I have learned to deal with it is to say, look, you know, kind of break down the problem and say, what are the areas where I have control, uh, which I can deal with? There are things that I have beyond my control, but others may be able to help. Is there a way to reach out to them, to your network and kind of do that? There's a third piece, which is, you know, it's beyond everybody's control. And, and then you have to say, okay, now how am I going to deal with it and move forward, right? But I think there, there are a couple of things that I want to leave in this and we can certainly discuss it more. The first part is about yourself and how do you get yourself comfortable and each of us has got a strategy to kind of calm ourselves down when it comes to a crisis situation. I think it's, it's, it's self, you know, it, it's, there's no one rule that fits everybody, but you have to experiment to see what works for you. The second is the point I made about reaching out to your network, which means you need to have a network and you don't create a network when you need it. You create a network when you don't need it, right? Because then you have people that you can reach out to. And then the third part, which I said, you know, fight or flight, uh, or, you know, have to deal with something. I think, um, you know, many of us are now put into more and more situations, whether it's in our personal lives, whether it's in our professional lives. And I think uh, it is experiential, you know, you've got to, you know, the more you deal with it, the more you kind of figure out how to, how to manage yourself. But I think that's the way I would think about it. Thank you. Uh, this is great insights, uh, Ram. Uh, I'm just curious to hear uh, maybe Charu or Guru, anything you would like to add? Uh, maybe um, Charu, do you like to go first and then maybe we'll go next with um, Guru? Sure. Uh, and I think just building on uh, what I heard from Ram, um, clearly the pandemic uh, showed us many, many things about ourselves, about our resilience, about our grit, about the, the, the world's resilience and grit. I think that that was to me the most, uh, I think, uplifting part of what we've handled over the last many years. And uh, one point of view that I want to share that I think took me somewhat by surprise when I learned about this is 
this VUCA world, right? Like this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world we live in. That's always been the case, right? Like I think we've all been part of this tech industry many years, and it's clear that change has just been the constant. Um, but this one concept I heard and learned in the last few years, which is if you want to discern this VUCA world, uh, instead of necessarily thinking about working on the next natural thing, you may have to kind of go back and practice what they call future back thinking, which means that instead of going from horizon one to horizon two, you go, you do a thought exper experiment and think about horizon three and look back and figure out what you must invest in horizon two. Right? I think that's a very powerful concept called future back thinking, which and, and there are a lot of people out there who say that to handle a VUCA world, you may need to kind of practice more future back thinking. And uh, I definitely, uh, I didn't know I was doing it back then you know, as we dealt with this uncertainty. But I think in hindsight, we were intent unintentionally maybe practicing future back thinking. So I just thought I'll share that perspective. Guru, anything you want to share on, on this topic? The, the disadvantage in uh, going last when uh, I have such eminent uh, fellow panelists is that they've taken away all the talking points, right? So I'll probably say something really simple. I think uh, human beings thrive uh, when either they are themselves very structured or when life imposes a certain sense of structure on them. And what the pandemic has done to all of, all of us, especially in our day-to-day -day lives, is to remove that sense of structure, right? The very act of waking up at a certain time in the morning, having a routine, having to go to work, having to come back at a certain time, having other elements of your life also circulating around this structure uh, gave us a sense of comfort, I feel, and also organized us in a certain way. And when you suddenly had that foundation taken away during the pandemic, uh, all of us had to struggle with just making sense of how to impose a certain sense of structure. So for me, uh, I think the initial part was one of discomfort around having this lack of structure and then finding that the more I was able to structure my life to mirror what I had before, at least in terms of hours when I would work, when I would go to the gym, when I would have some se separation between the various elements of my life, uh, I became more productive. And so that's just like a tactical uh, tip I can share. Very interesting. I think definitely I have learned uh, quite a few things out of this conversation. Uh, great. So uh, just kind of switching. Uh, one of the things I think I keep hearing from many folks is like, let's say, hey, as leaders, most of you come across like very much kind of you know, energetic and passionate, basically, right? So what's kind of keeping you kind of you know, going, right? What what sort of the maybe like, you know, I don't know if there's any like... Uh, passion, like hobbies, or I don't know if there's any secrets you would like to reveal uh, to this uh, audience. Maybe we'll start with uh, this time with you, Charu. Okay. Thank you. You knew I wanted to engage on this topic. So I'm just going to lean over. Uh, what you see there is my bonsai. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, but anyway, this is, uh, this, is, this is something that I'm passionate about creating. Over the last five, six years, I've uh, put in more time. Though I will admit, I'm a kindergarten level at making, creating bonsai. So lots of learning uh, ahead for me. So I, I think the thing that I uh, really leaned on heavily was uh, was family, right? Like I think just, uh, it was just great to have my son around me as we kind of handle this. Uh, so family, my parents, uh, just kind of spending more time, I think more present because literally you didn't have a choice. You were not leaving the house. So a uh, lot more kind of presence at the home. And then, of course, my hobbies. I will tell you a couple of uh, things, right? Bonsai, while I was able to pursue my bonsai, I attempted, uh, I used to attempt singing Carnatic music, but I was, I'm not too good at it. I'm not very good at it at all. And then I realized that in the pandemic, I didn't want to subject my teacher to my off key music, and I ended up stopping <laughs> learning Carnatic. But in hindsight, I think I wish I just kept on. I think so, learning something new uh, always energizes me. And so, to me, I would say, Anything you can put your heart and soul into uh, to kind of cre give you that creative outlet uh, definitely kept me intact. Uh, curious to know what Ram and Guru did. So, Ram? I let Guru go first. I mean, I don't want to be stealing his thunder every time. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm uh, you know, particularly absent of, of any thunder today. No, I... Um, I I, I think, you know, there's, I was, I was going to facetiously say, fake it till you make it, right? Like, you know, in terms of energy, I think all of us are human beings. There are days when we are energetic, there are days when we are not. And I think it's 
a part of normalizing uh, these varying energy levels is to admit that no matter how uh, you you might perceive people in their public personas as being highly passionate and uh, very uh, aggressively energetic uh, they will you can take it to the bank will have moments when they are not that way right so uh, this holds true for me it holds true for ram for charu and anybody else so let's normalize the fact that we as human beings will have ups and downs that's fine uh, but in general i think in the in the broader continuum of life you need to aim for a, a life for yourself not just for your career where you do feel more optimistic and energetic and happy than not right so uh, i think one for me it is i rely on a sense of non seriousness and I, i don't take things too seriously and uh, i i like to have a self image of myself as an extremely happy person and i think building these uh, images of yourself to be one thing or another is also an important determinant of whether you actually end up being that way right so i that's been my experience uh, of this as, as well and of course i i'm a creature of habit i i like routines i like doing the same thing at certain times uh, i like eating the same things every day the, the, you know i i like to minimize the number of decisions i have to make uh, so as a result i end up uh, focusing on a few things very diligently because they are sources of energy for me one of them is uh, investing some time in uh, going to the gym and working out so that's like something that's not compromisable for me so i i end up doing that rigorously re- regularly on a daily basis uh, as far as i can uh, the other is i love writing so i do spend some time whenever i can uh, to write and uh, the uncharitable will uh, tell you that i use even my emails as practice for my writing skills so uh, you know my emails are uh, horribly long in many cases and uh, maybe way too wordy and verbose so uh, with apologies to the audience is just me exercising my personality and poetic license there so i think all of us have different things that drive us as human beings uh, some rely on family and rest and relaxation others rely on uh, hobbies like the one that charu talked about uh, and you know i think each of us has to orient ourselves in that direction and make sure that we are giving enough time to all elements that make us us right we can't just feed one side and expect that life is going to be happy i like yeah. that phrase so think, uh, fake it or fake it till you make it right uh, sorry ram go ahead <laughs> oh, no no i was i was going to resonate with what guru said though i am a little opposite i actually like variety um so you know that's what makes us different but i, I will attest to guru's writing ability because i sometimes get whatsapp messages at late in the night <laughs> from guru which are quite verbose but it is fine you know i love reading them but the thing is you know from my perspective i actually like like i said i like variety yes all of us you know i i totally resonate with guru's point that all of us are human you know not every day looks the same not every day do you feel the same you know and some of us are older than others so you you know some of that starts to kick in i mean it is who we are right but for me personally i think i like variety so i actually get involved in a lot of different things which are not just work related you know uh, you mentioned the fact that i i spend a lot of time with nascom but i do uh, but not because of the title or the privilege that comes with some of those kinds of involvements but it's because the people that you meet you know i draw a lot of energy from others and uh, and to me i think that is one of the biggest things that i miss the in person interactions that was you know absent for a couple of years um i i will give you one example yesterday i was at the you know nascom women product champions kick off which is essentially a new program that we are launching from a diversity perspective to actually you know help a lot of women senior you know achieve senior roles in the in the product space but it's fantastic you know i was the only male member speaker there i mean it was a privilege to be in the opposite uh, opposite side of the equation where you know um, i you know i was uh, i was privileged right to be the only male speaker in the entire conference which which i think derives a lot of energy and this is fantastic set of conversations that i was part of so anyway so i think you know again comes down to each individual and how they actually get involved in various other things but for me that is very important you know i i spend a lot of time on that but i also take time out right mundane things interest me i spend you know i enjoy cutting onions in the in the kitchen because it's just that that mundaneness is actually helpful uh, one of the things i miss about my us life is i used to enjoy cutting the grass a lot of people don't but i used to enjoy the you know the art that it took to cut the grass because it was you know It was mindless time, but it it allows you to kind of your mind to relax. So I I look for those opportunities as well in addition to all the others. Great insights, uh, Ram. I used to do a lot of farming, obviously in the pandemic days. So that kind of you know, really kind of helped me. 
Great. So uh, let's hear a little bit about your personal stories, right? I think maybe this time, uh, let's start with Guru. Um, I want to ask you this question, like, uh, as a leader of the organization, right? Um, during the pandemic, how was your personal journey? Like, what was it going to you as a individual, right? Uh, are you the same guru, like maybe before the pandemic and now? Have you changed anything in, in your leadership styles or whatnot? Can you talk a little more on your personal journey? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I have remained the same or not. I think, uh, you know, somebody else might have to comment because I always think I'm, I've remained the same. Uh, so people who know me know that I am extremely an extroverted, people-centric person. I'm, I thrive being around people and uh, I, I take great pleasure in actually knowing practically everybody in the organization in some way, shape or form. And uh, to have that particular thing in my life completely cut away initially was, was very, very hard. I missed going to the office uh, severely. I missed that human connection. Uh, and I was uh, finding it kind of claustrophobic and suffocating to always be afraid of, you know, you know who you meet and wearing a mask and what you touch and all of that, right? So those were not things that I would practice regularly in my life. Uh, I always led with my right hand first. I was always eager to shake people's hands. Uh, and uh, here we are, right? We, we had to go through this. So uh, both my daughters were at home at that time. You know, they were, uh, one was beginning her life in college. The other was in high school. So it was uh, hard to see all of us kind of retreat into our individual rooms for a significant part of the day being on calls and then uh, emerge at the end already kind of tired with all this two-dimensional interaction that we were all uh, subject to. I think so. Uh, I can't say that I'm uh, there. I've met a few people who said, oh, I loved the pandemic. It was an awesome time of my life. I reconnected with myself. I really enjoyed the solitude. You're not looking at a person who's going to say any of that. I did not enjoy the pandemic. I did not like it. I absolutely am the kind of person who wants to go out and meet people all the time. So it has been difficult for me. No question about it. Um, the casual interactions that happen as you walk to and fro between uh, desks and meetings and things like that completely our life is devoid of all of that so the minute our office is opened i started going every day so i am one of those people who goes to the office every single day uh, so i i think bringing that structure making sure i uh, i i continue to invest in things that i'm interested in i i like sport a lot i'm a huge tennis fan uh, so I, I probably watched more tennis during the last two years than I've been able to uh, in the last few years. This year's US Open has been fantastic. So uh, I've, I've enjoyed all of that. Of course, watching a bunch of different shows with my daughters. So if you have teenage daughters, uh, you realize your age a lot faster because you're constantly reminded of how old you are and how out of touch with reality you are. So being able to watch the shows they watch, listen to the music they listen to, uh, and practice the lingo that is completely ununderstandable to me, but at least, you know, making it sound like I know what it means and using it in the right context uh, has been a huge enabler of making sure that I don't get laughed at by my daughters constantly. So there are some positives to uh, this time as well. I can completely... Sorry, what was that, Ram? Sorry, I interrupted you. I, I said I, I'll have to just... I have to start using different lingo with him from, from now on. That's right. Bro... <laughs> <laughs> and I was saying I can completely relate to what uh, Guru told, you know, about the teenage daughters, right? And I think the amount of shows in Netflix I have watched, I don't think I would have ever watched uh, if my daughter was not around. <laughs> Great, Charu, anything you would like to uh, um, uh, add on that? Um, oh, I, I, I developed quite the taste for K-drama for the folks on the audience <laughs> who like K-drama. <laughs> so uh, my teenage son was quite disturbed at how much K-drama his mom was watching. <laughs> But uh, that having been said, uh, I think there was a couple of uh, shifts I saw in myself as a leader after the pandemic. And I wanted to just talk about that, right? which is I realized that along the way, the most crucial missing element was the social capital we have with our people, right? Like when um, what you expect, you meet somebody in the coffee room and um, or you have that like interaction where you where you energize and you feel energized. That was so hard in, in the two-dimensional world, as Guru talked about. And I, so I, I realized that I had to find small ways to rebuild that social capital. Like I, I, I had the uh, honor of like you know delivering mangoes that 
happened to grow in my i had a good mango yield and so i hand delivered mangoes to all the folks on my leadership team like i would not have thought of it in the past but i later realized that that small act of me just driving around and dropping stuff off or like sending some sweets that were homemade during diwali all those things make a big difference i think people realize that need for connection and they respond so i think that social capital was a big piece and then i also realized that i became a lot more concise uh, and and almost subtracted a whole bunch of non essentials from my life uh, the, i i think the years before the pandemic i would i would have filled my life with a whole bunch of things and feel a little bit burnt out uh, but preserving energies became like a big skill you learned in the pandemic right otherwise you would go through these ridiculously long hours through the day and sometimes into the night and come back feeling drained and you're like why are you doing so many things and i definitely learned what i call the subtraction mindset you know like uh, there's this concept that often uh, leaders are really editors right like you need to kind of cut out things that are distracting and um, um boring and things like that and so i would definitely say as a leader i shifted that for myself and hopefully for the people on my team which means that what we worked on was more uh, kind of directed it was more precise as opposed to uh, potentially uh, focusing on p2s um, so that was like a, another big shift i noticed in myself so um, back to you sadish do you anything you would like to add uh, on no, your I journey think, uh, I, you know to guru's point uh, going last actually they have covered all the point but a couple of things from a personal perspective I think one is I I always thought of myself as an empathetic person but I realized how much more empathy was needed during the last few years right in terms of uh, people their own personal situations the what they're dealing with you know you got a lot more comfortable with you know uh, lowering your own guard when it comes to empathy and I think that is a big shift I see in myself today um, I don't know what will change based on you know going back to in person interactions I don't know if that will change anything but uh, but I think that was one area that I realized on a more lighter note i also realized i hate commute anymore right i don't want to get in a car and drive for you know as you know sudesh i live on the other side of bangalore and and driving to our office in jp nagar was an hour and a half commute each way i don't know if i have the appetite to do this anymore right because uh, and to charu's point you know you want to minimize your 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 the extraneous time you are spending on various other things which is okay i think in the new hybrid world you know who knows you know uh, maybe that time can be utilized for something else. so i think these are probably just you know, other points um, but yes i also realized new areas of interest which i probably thought i didn't have so <laughs> one thing is for sure sudesh uh, ram you know i think we will we'll live in the wrong city because we are not getting the mangoes or the homemade diwali sweets i know i will courier them to you next time <laughs> how about that <laughs> great so let's so, let's so the, yeah and it was great to hear the yeah. personal journeys right and i'm really hoping like the audience is kind of able to kind of learn something you know from that or relate something to this right let's switch the context to a little bit about the teams right let's talk a little bit about our teams like uh, what was it like <clears throat> about the, them so one thing i can i can this is to you ram like one thing i keep hearing you right is like at least in vmr we almost doubled our workforce right uh, during the sort of the pandemic time so how was it like uh, getting all the new hires and then kind of you know really kind of uh, having the cultural element of integration values and then having a sense of sort of a belonging for them right so how was it like especially the workforce was like you know a lot of junior engineers and mid juniors to seniors basically there right yeah. so can you a little bit talk about that how was that uh, like Yeah so i think uh, you know I, i'm sure the others have also good examples i think all organizations kind of grew during the pandemic um i, I think the couple of things you know from my mind right on the transactional stuff i think all of us were very successful you know hiring people getting them on board onboarding them making sure that they got you know all the things necessary for them to get going you know even including uh, you know kind of onboarding processes and all that i think all of us are kind of perfect where i think there is still a work to be done is on the cultural elements because there is no substitute for the point that guru made earlier right you're walking around you're seeing the office they see each other they interact with their teams at a more casual level you know those are those that's where culture gets built right i mean that's really where people start to understand how you know what what works in an environment what doesn't work 
you know, what are some of the norms that get followed in every organization in their cultures? I think that is probably where all organizations, I think, are struggling. And because I have this conversation with a number of people. And as offices open up and people interact, and it doesn't need to be every day, right? I mean, at least for some portion of the of your of your daily routine, you are interacting with people in a three-dimensional and in-person space. I think that's very critical. And I think that has been the casualty over the last few years. Um, as people talk about, you know, uh, hybrid or fully remote or whatever it is, I think all of us have to think think through how we actually build those contexts and cultures. Now, the, the norms that exist and the methodologies that existed to do this in the past, I think they need to be rethought. And uh, and I think to me, the you know, when a lot of people, and there's a lot of, you know, if, if you think about the, the debate that's starting up in a lot of ways, you talk about quiet quitting. You know, there's a big debate happening around, you know, it was all the great resignation. Now it's about quiet quitting and people in your environment who are just doing what they absolutely need to do, no stretch work, no engagements, et cetera, right? So that's one debate. The other one, this whole moonlighting debate, you know, people getting working on things which is beyond their day job. You know, how, how much appetite is there in organizations to do that? Let people do that, right? I mean, you don't own 24 hours of somebody. You pay them for the work that they do. But at the same time, you know, there are obligations. You have an employment contract with a company. How do you follow that? But many organizations, the good part is they have they have clauses and policies that allow them to, you know, declare what they're doing and do it. Right? That there's no conflict. Nobody has a mission. So I think there are a lot of these kinds of new kinds of conversations that are coming up, which will form, you know, uh, we were talking about future of work as being, you know, sitting in front of Zoom or something, but that's not what future of work is. Future of work and interaction culture and, you know, organization building is, I think, the next wave of learnings that we will all need to do as leaders to take it forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. Great insights. Uh, anything like uh, Guru, um, you would like to sort of add from your um, perspective? Sure. I think uh, for uh, you know, I, I completely agree with Ram, and I think the biggest thing a leader can do is to dramatically increase increase the volume of trust right in the, uh, within the system. Uh, I think mo most of us are way past the days in our lives when we used to be great programmers or great architects or anything like that, at least speaking for myself, right? But I think as uh, you have greater privilege in terms of uh, serving people, then your job is to increase that volume of trust in the system. And doing it remotely is super difficult because I think you need to put empathy into action directly in terms of compassion. And being able to kind of have enough time uh, managing your own energy levels, but at, at the same time, keeping a close watch on what's happening with every member of the team and filling them with enough focus, clarity, as well as passion to do the job really well and not fall prey to these uh, hashtags, right? Like either it's the great resignation or quiet quitting, all of which has have happened since time immemorial, I, I think, but we just have fancy names for them now. But I, I think the... What I've been kind of stressing on, uh, Sudish, is uh, I think for all of us, to the extent that we lead other people or can influence other people, I think we need to also create some distinctions between passion and pride. I think passion is uh, temporary. Pride is permanent. Uh, passion can be temporary. It can, it can be long-lived, but uh, very often we will fall in love with things and fall out of love with things as well. But pride... Uh, having a sense of pride in who you are, what you do, what you stand for, uh, what you will not compromise on. I think it's important for us to develop a self-awareness framework where we are very clear about what we are proud of. right? And that pride will power so much more uh, in our lives than just a foolish pursuit of passion being everything. That's, so that's the way I've been kind of managing my teams to fill them with a sense of pride around the impact they create and keep on reiterating that sense of what we are doing and why we are doing it and what it means to our customers and our company. And because there is no option now. We don't have a way to transmit energy in person. You have, And you cannot possibly meet every single person on your team one-on-one -on -one all the time. So you just have to find a way, uh, an alternate way to transmit the same thing and increase the level of trust. Yeah, absolutely. I think the sense of pride, autonomy, the identity and purpose, right? All of this sort of becoming more and more relevant, right? You know, especially for for the workforce and with the current situation, what we are in, it's more more relevant. So just switching context, uh, Charu. Uh, uh, anything, any kind of more from an employee perspective, right? Like, um, 
can you talk about some of the maybe like i don't know the new policies or frameworks that you can kind of introduce during these times to support the support the teams uh, can you talk a little bit on that yeah thanks and uh, i just want to lead uh, with that entire point i heard about kind of culture right uh, which is at the end of the day the, the lived experience of our employees how did they feel during these uncertain times how did they handle it where they did they feel supported i think all that were, were game changing and finally i think they translate to the kind of impact they're willing to create for the company right so so that lived experience which means managers had to pay a lot more attention and i think ram used the word empathy um at microsoft we have a framework called model coach care where you both role model uh the the aspire to kind of culture that you want you are coaching your engineer, your uh, team to kind of give you the kind of impact you want and most importantly kind of caring understanding okay what is our context and making sure that you go that extra mile and i think especially last year many of us may remember the may june july kind of time frame which were very very rough for the country and i think this required us to go to unprecedented lengths to demonstrate that caring for the employee and a lot of uh, a lot of us have these experiences where employees came back and said if you hadn't sent us that concentrator home my mother would not be alive and that mattered right like people cared about the fact that organizations cared about them and their families so i think at the core of it i would say the policies that helped us kind of uh, you know give the salary advances and all the kind of progressive policies that we did from a uh, from a benefits perspective i think we're game changing but we also did a few important uh, changes right like we uh, because it was getting uh, i call it like collaboration tax it gets really hard to be on teams calls zoom calls for others right all the time and so what do you what do you do to create that space for people uh, so we intentionally created uh, quiet weeks uh, sometimes quiet days uh, no meeting friday fridays became institutionalized uh, we still now uh, also have every month we take a day of learning and we say this is to say it's either self driven or sometimes the team driven kind of learning opportunities for people so institutionalizing others and kind of giving people a lot more kind of flexibility to think about how they wanted to structure their time so that level of uh, i think high, we call it hybrid by design i completely agree with ram it's not about zoom meetings it's it's gone way past that i think going forward we realize that our workforce is going to be hybrid by design right there is no other we are not going to go back to the pre pandemic days anymore i mean that's just the world has shifted in a one way direction i think on that front so that having been said how do you make people and teams and i definitely want to a huge shout out to the folks in the audience or either students or early in career you want to kind of go into a culture that respects you and values you and the ideas you bring to the table right i think at microsoft we definitely embrace this culture that great ideas can come from anywhere and we have a lot of examples of where we haven't listened to people you know sometimes coming out of campus telling us that this is important uh, but i in hindsight we wish we had listened and and i think that entire inclusion index concept has kind of become really key uh, but going back to the folks in the audience really think about finding your voice and using your voice right like leaning in and being part of the debate and the conversation and not sitting it out i i always like uh encourage my team members to turn on the videos i role model it myself but very few of them will turn it on but i wish more people would turn it on and be willing to you know share those expressions even the person behind you is or maybe somebody came to help you or you occasionally heard your mom ask you a question and you hear it on a teams chat it's okay right i mean we, we realize that we don't have to necessarily mask that side of who we are and just be willing to bring a more of ourselves into kind of work and kind of lean in so that's all i had to add sudesh to that that topic uh, no that's great great points um, um, charu uh, just um, th there's one other question that kind of came up is mostly around the noise right so there is like a lot of noise and you know, one is obviously there are acquisitions and uh, more of like the financial slowdown and what not basically right and obviously we have the pandemic uh, for the last two years so how do we as leaders how do you all kind of keep the teams focused right and make sure at the end of the day there is a delivery outcome we are meeting what our customers are asking and so on basically so how does this balance kind of you know happens uh, uh, maybe guru anything uh, i don't know if you have any any good way of doing this any advice to the team 
uh, i think it's all a matter of perspective sudesh and it's uh, maybe uh, you know i'm guilty of being further along in my career and uh, having greater insight into why that is noise and how i can cut it out right and uh, and the 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 more than just the streaks of gray in my hair are probably the, to my advantage here now the question is uh, you know to to all of us you know we, we i think we are inundated by uh news in general and much of that news is largely negative there's uh, there's like a trp lifting quality that bad news has that is it seems to be irresistible to the world now uh, so in my job for example does it really matter that a search giant is going to lay off people or that an e-commerce giant has slowed down hiring not much but somehow it's all over my news feed and uh, if if i'm so prone i can Uh, take away the message that oh my god the world is falling apart and you know what am i going to do about it so i think in each of our own companies also there are reorgs a plenty happening and people leaving people coming the rank and file uh, uh, the life of an engineer or a product manager who has a clear charter and clear outcomes and goals that they're working towards doesn't really change it uh, the the code that you're supposed to write you are going to write it anyway whether an svp in the company has left or joined or whatever but somehow there is uh, an impact when you hear news like this when you see something like this i think for for me it is constantly reminding people that you're not going to help yourself in any way by focusing on things that are not in your control and i think ram talked about this earlier right what's in your control is the only thing that you can really uh, uh, impact the rest of it uh, you either accept with a, a sense of humility and uh, you know calmness or you you try to figure out a way around it other than that there's no other uh, thing you can really impact so for me it's like what are you working on is it giving you a lot of learning do you are you surrounded by people that you enjoy working with and you respect and you learn from and is your job affording you enough of a zone of discomfort where you constantly feel like you're uh, you're you're pushing your boundaries and becoming a bigger person right if that is true then leave out all the other noise right and so i think for for us as leaders taking a taking a data driven approach keeping the metrics that your team is uh, accountable to making sure that you're constantly highlighting them and talking about them in every meeting tracking them making sure that people are always orienting their attention towards those right uh, is an important trick which was not maybe necessary as much before the pandemic because you had more organic opportunities to infuse some energy but now you have to do it in a very tactical and mindful way yeah these are yeah. great insights and i'm sure like a um, lot of learning to this audience ram you like to add anything or I, so you no i think one of the things is uh, constantly help people clarify what is important i think to me as a leader our job is not about the how it's about the what and why and being able to draw that line of sight for people to, and you know what is an average person looking for one is validation of what they're doing is it important or not are they making a difference second you know somebody you know reminding them that they are valued even at an individual level i think to me a lot of the, but the inclusion aspect is the fact that you are identifying people individually and and you know giving them the uh, due recognition that they are seeking and looking for uh, if it doesn't matter what you're working on right it's it's not just you know the r&d guys in the organization especially since all of us come from technical orgs you know it's not that the r&d guys have a special place in the heart for everybody versus somebody in finance or in real estate or somewhere else i think it's about everybody doing their job uh, helping them understand why they are important and then shining a light on them when it's important, you know when it's necessary i think these are the simple things that can be done by anybody it doesn't need to be us right it can be anybody in the organization you be able to do that you know call them out you know, respect them for what they do and then i think that really helps in people you know calming them down in terms of what they do uh, so, i mean i think that's what i believe in and uh, I, that's what i espouse with all of my leaders in my organization absolutely anything charu you would like to add just a, a, this philosophy that i think uh, we all are practicing right we are kind of well known as this ubuntu philosophy which says ubuntu not just the operating system but ubuntu the philosophy an african philosophy that says i am because we are i think it's beautiful philosophy and more than ever before i realize how interconnected we all are 
right? Like, I mean, this conversation would have required me to catch a flight and come to Bangalore and hang out with Guru Ram and Sudhish, right? Like, if you're doing it so naturally, literally an hour in my calendar. I'm just saying that realizing that you're you are creating impact, but you're not the only one creating that impact, that it takes everyone in the organization from real estate, facilities, uh, the, the people in, in your office who are helping you ship your office chairs back to your house, right? So that you can have a comfortable day at work. And, and, and everyone in the team, right out of college, people who've been, you know, years in the industry, maybe have joined you from an open source background, data scientists, design engineers, ML, uh, specialist, right? Like it takes people of different, I think different kinds of diversity, cognitive diversity to kind of come on board. So that level of, I think, inclusion uh, that we need to demonstrate so that we can create that impact is just massive. And you realize how interconnected you are. And I think there's one big shift I saw at Microsoft for sure, which is the level of understanding of geodiversity. I think the world realized that to run global businesses, you needed a global workforce. And I think the, the world shifted in terms of how to think about geo, geo inclusion as well. So I'll, I just wanted to say, big believer in this philosophy, I am because we are Ubuntu. Uh, so just wanted to share that. Uh, back to you, yeah. Sanish. That, that, that's, I think that's a great learning. At least uh, I have heard it uh, first time, so it's, it's great. So. I'm going to take a few questions from the audience. So I think there is a related question uh, to Ram's point. This was mostly about like um, customer facing departments may have may deal with the higher certainty, uncertainty and ambiguity compared to the departments um, away from the customers such as like research and you know, development, right? So what type of ambiguity does your department face more frequently? Um, I'm not sure uh, who would like to answer this. Yeah, I think this question has been posted. I mean, I can take a stab at it. And, uh, you know, the thing is, I'm not sure, you know, uh, any one department or a part of the organization faces any more uncertainty than another part of the organization. There are different drivers for these uncertainties. And as we have, you know, quite eloquently, you know, others, everybody kind of weighed in on what can be those differences that can come in. So I think the, the biggest thing here, again, I go back to my point of saying, okay, I, you know, I, I'm facing something. What is it that I can do about it? You know, or can I affect something that can make that different, change that, that dynamics that is showing up? If I can't, right, can I focus on something that I need to do? And it's, you know, is it value? Is it important for something to do? I think to me, I think that's the way to think about what it is, because it doesn't matter. You know, every if, if there is uncertainty, everybody is uncertain. And if there is clarity, everybody is everybody has clarity. So I think that's the important part to focus on is to say, can I drive more clarity or can I get more clarity from somebody else who knows more than me to be able to decide for myself as to what my course of action should be as I look at it. I think, I think uh, uh, so I just wanted to layer on top of Ram's point, right? I think uh, the question is a nice one. I, I really appreciate the, the thought behind it. And I think uh, in a sense, right, the closer you are to the customer, the velocity of change and the need for discovery of uh, changing uh, times as they impact people's lives and the digitization that it's bringing about, I think I can resonate with that in some sense because the area that I'm in, which is uh, digital payments, there's been quite a tremendous amount of change in the last few, uh, last couple of years. But as Ram said, right, like, I think it's all a matter of perspective. No matter where you are, I think all of us as humans are tuned to thinking that there is a greater volume of change and ambiguity in our own context than somebody else's. So, uh, which is not necessarily true. Everybody feels that way. So it is true for everybody and not true for everybody. Uh, I think the, the approach that I kind of uh, preach to my teams in some sense is to enjoy the ambiguity because uh, that ambiguity is an opportunity for us to constantly feel that there is something new and something novel and interesting in our work, right? If everything was just the same, then I, I think all of us would agree that it would be a boring job very quickly. So the question is, how do you uh, treat this ambiguity as something that's inserting that slight element of spice that makes life interesting? That's okay. Yeah, absolutely. 
I think there's also another question that's mostly around the organizational adaptability. Um, so how to achieve organizational adaptability, structural or procedural in uncertain times? Um, anything, Charu, Ram, would like to talk about that? I think it goes back to um, this entire notion of, do you have that leadership bandwidth in different parts of your organization? One thing we noticed was um, our teams were becoming large. We all saw some massive growth. And in fact, we were onboarding a lot of new managers. Uh, one thing we noticed was teams that didn't have the right org structure, right? Like maybe there was not enough leadership bandwidth for every individual contributor to have a one-on-one -on -one with their manager. Uh, those teams were struggling. So one big shift that we did make was we thought about our organizational span and the design kind of much more intentionally. Um, so so I, I think it is harder to be a manager in hybrid than in the times when we physically were in one office. Microsoft now is spread across three locations in India. And inherently, we, of course, have our talent spread across other cities be, be, uh, uh, beyond our talent hubs as well. So how do you now, in essence, kind of create, manage large teams that are spread across the, uh, the nation and if you did it with the assumption that okay you're going to have that coffee room conversation the answer is you're not and so how do you kind of energize your troops so i think the the big shift we had to make and i don't think we've succeeded at it, at it yet is how do we energize teams in these hybrid settings how do we do morale how do we do all hands uh, one interesting note is like we saw more participation in our virtual all hands than in our physical all hands like the in-person all hands. So uh, just interesting to see how the world had shifted and how did we adapt. So I think thinking about your organizational design, the structure, and thinking about energizing your leadership team initially, and then the larger organization becomes even more crucial. Thanks, Sharu. I'm going to pick one more question. So this is about the communication and direction for the team, right? So what exercises do you adapt to set and communicate direction to your teams in ambiguous environment. So let me um, pick that up. I think I want to also relate it back to the. Sorry, Guru, did you have something? After you. Uh, well. Okay. So first of all, I think um, both for answering the earlier question and this one, I think they're related in some ways. Um, I don't think it's a free for all. You know, while it may look like it's more natural. Um, I think as, a, as, as most of us who are leading organizations, there is a structure and a framework most of us have in our minds in terms of how the engagement model should, should be executed. Right? Um, and part of this is, you know, you know it's, it's natural. Right? I mean, you pick the constituencies that you care about. One is the customers. And how are we dealing with customers? How do we actually create, you know, surface area for people to innovate towards the customers and making their life easier? You know, we do it in, in roadmaps. But you do out of band innovation as well. And that's the reason why innovation is a, is a fairly large topic in most organizations. The second piece to this is who delivers that? It's the people. And it's not just about talent. I mean, most people talk about talent in isolation. I mean, they talk about it in the context of hiring people, and kind of managing retention and all that other stuff. But to me, I think you have to address talent as individuals. You know, what's driving them singularly and collectively? And are we creating those learning opportunities for people? That will keep them both relevant for today's context and for the future context. The point Chavu made earlier about, you know, working backwards from a future state, right? Future potential state, and are we preparing people for that for that kind of state? The third piece to this, your ecosystem, your, whether it's your partners, whether it's your, you know, people who help you get your message out, etc. Cetera, et cetera, right? So I think there's a whole partner ecosystem around you that you need to, you know, engage and orchestrate. And I'm talking particularly in the context of large organizations. But I think this is probably relevant in smaller organizations as well. If you do these three things well, right, and then of course it will follow, the tactics will follow under each of these buckets. But if you do that well and you align it against the larger corporate goals, as well as what people care about, I think a lot of times it's a lot easier to get people aligned and, and, and doing things which they believe will add value to them. And then of course, last but not least is recognition. You know, that's the other part, the rewards and recognition mechanism that goes with it. Uh, it doesn't need to be monetary. It doesn't need to be T-shirts, right? I mean, it could be just as simple as giving them a badge of honor that you know that uh, that they can put on their uh, you know, either physically or virtually, you know, can display. I think those are the kinds of things that uh, that people appreciate and, and be able to do more. 
So to me, I think it's a very deliberate process and it needs to be thought through deliberately, but it needs to come across as if, you know, it's, it's just business as usual. So this the only thing I'll add. I mean, I'm completely in alignment with Ram and maybe a, a different dimension to the communication pro uh, question that's been asked, very, very pertinent question, is that one, uh, the frequency of communication has to, I think, dramatically increase, uh, as should access, right? So uh, one of the ways in which I've been orienting uh, to my teams is to open up my calendar and gamify some of this opening up of my calendar as well. And uh, having a name like Guru gives me infinite opportunities to uh, leverage my name uh, to good effect, right? So, uh, for example, one of the programs I have is um, anybody can take time on my calendar uh, in 30 minute or 45 minute chunks. The only requirement I have for them is that they come and teach me something. Uh, and the teaching me is not something that they think will impress me, but it has to be something that they are so passionate and proud of that they cannot help talking about it. So, uh, and the program is called Be a Guru to Guru. Uh, as, as you can see, I am uh, blessed to have a name that I can uh, creatively use. So, uh, this is, you know, one way in which I've got, I've also got my completely open door when it comes to Slack or Teams or any of the communication channels. My uh, number is easily available to everybody in the company. People can write to me about anything. And I always have a reasonably quick turnaround time. Uh, email is probably my least... Uh, preferred option for communication. I think keeping that access open gives you more people reaching out to you and that gives you an ability to constantly reiterate messages and direction and focus uh, at even at an individual level beyond just having all hands and ask me any things that uh, you can do this in. Great insights, um, uh, Guru. Just I can't use my name that effectively, Guru, because uh, hey, Ram doesn't resonate sometimes. <laughs> how about how about Ram with Ram? That might be really good. You might see a lot of people coming. Yeah, yeah exactly. unfortunately, I don't know whether Ram <laughs> is going to like that. I may have other kinds of discussions going on, right? I may not be learning. Or that. Rasam with Ram. How about that? That might be a yeah, good yeah, one. That, that, good. That's awesome. that could be interesting for Ram, definitely. <laughs> Great. So let's a little bit switch the context in terms of looking into the opportunities as well, right? Because sometimes we relate. Uh, um, the changes or pandemic, everything to the negativity, right? But there's like tons of opportunity that comes as well. There are like a lot of companies that that were like born during these times, right? So maybe I want to ask you this question, Ram, like how is the startup ecosystem doing uh, this time and what's the role like technology is playing, right? You know, during this time of um, pandemic, you're pretty, sure. pretty close to that ecosystem. So do you want to share some insights um, uh, from that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's going very well. I mean, it's a, uh... You know, we have 15,000 tech startups in India, 3,000 of which are deep tech. And, uh, you know, we are seeing uh, some phenomenal founders. I mean, they're solving problems. I'll give you one example. I mean, we have a deep tech club under NASCOM. And uh, the acceptance rate used to be about uh, 15% on the applications. What we are noticing is that, you know, cohort by cohort, it's becoming harder and harder to refuse people, right? Because the kind of problems they're solving, the width of problems they're solving, it's phenomenal. So I think... We are very bullish about the fact that I think the Indian ecosystem is doing very well. But the thing is, there's also a lot of other learnings that come out of you know being engaged with the with a, with the smaller organizations which are starting up. There's a lot to be learned in terms of their uh, what's driving them. You know, what are some of the challenges they face? I mean, there are some you know day-to-day -day things that uh, as a small company you deal with, and the resilience with which these folks are dealing with it. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the resilience aspects which you can bring back. I mean, most of us who are larger organizations take things for granted, which you can't in a smaller organization by default, right? And why, why it's... So I think a lot of those things are working, you know, uh, there's a lot of learnings for even for people like us when we engage with that ecosystem to actually pick up and, and, and utilize when we come back to our own organizations in terms of doing these things. So uh, so I, I think, you know, I would encourage people to, to look at how they can engage more with the larger ecosystem. I go back to the point I made around partners. Because partners doesn't need to be our large partners. They can be small partners too. And how do we engage with them? How do we kind of learn from these kinds of organizations? And so it's a lot happening. Great. Yeah, I think we are kind of almost uh, top of the hour. Otherwise, I really wanted to ask like, a few questions. Like, for example, I think there's a lot going on in the cloud space and you know modernization, moving things to cloud. There's a lot going on in the financial industry, like you know, UPIs and whatnot. 
So I don't know uh, how much more time we have. Um, uh, next me, are we already top of the hour, or should we? Uh, do we need to get to the conclusion now, or can we take like five more minutes? I just want to check with you, Bhavia. Yeah. Hey, Sudesh, we are already on time. Okay, so maybe I can just ask maybe one more last question uh, to the panelists. Uh, so, as a technologist, do you do you have any advice to the participant today, right? In terms of like how they can build their technical expertise and capabilities and craft their career, right? After all, that's the theme for the for the uh, conference. Anything maybe uh, Ram, Guru, Charu, then we'll close and then we'll you know, hand over to Babi. Sure. Maybe we'll start with you, Ram. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, I would encourage all technologists to learn the business side of things because uh, the what and the why, I go back to the point I made earlier, the what and why is as important as the how. And uh, you may you will actually do a better job of doing the how if you understand the what and the why. So I would suggest that people focus less on point technologies and understand, you know, of course, understanding technology trends and broader aspects of what technology is are very critical and important. But many of us have come, you know, have been in this journey for a long time and have seen things come and go. But something that stays with you is the ability to actually, you know, analyze, understand, analyze, and then implement in that order as you look ahead. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Ram. That's, that's cool. amazing yeah. advice by Ram. Uh, I think uh, not, not a whole lot I can say on that front, right? It's such a crisp and clear articulation of what is really important to build a great career. The only thing I'd add is I think it's easier today than ever before to become better and better at what you do. The resources that are available on the internet for us to learn in depth uh, and get uh, become experts at what uh, we want to become experts in is has never been easier. And so I'd say for technologists uh, in the initial part of your career, you definitely need to go deep on the T. If you view your career's uh, progression as a T-shaped thing in terms of capabilities, there is definitely a need for depth in the initial part of your career that then slowly starts branching out into breadth. So to the extent possible, don't ever give up that depth right? in, in a pursuit of the breadth. Uh, and second, the, another important thing from my own uh, experience, and I know that Ram practices it so beautifully, not just with his contributions to the ecosystem, but also broadly as a, as a human being, a paid forward mentality in everything that you do. Uh, regardless of what uh, position you hold, there is always an opportunity to help somebody else without expecting anything in return in terms of altruism. Uh, practice it and you won't, you will be really surprised at how beautifully it comes back and repays you in your career as well. Absolutely. Love that. Uh, Charu? Thanks, Sudesh, and uh, the rest of you as well. Great panel. I just put my thoughts in chat. Uh, my only thing is we're all witnessing a massive shift in our journey as human beings. And I think it's really important we all lean in, become engaged, and really be part of it as opposed to sitting it out. So my only advice would be lean in and be part of the conversation. So thank you again for having all of us at this panel. Yeah, thank you very much. I want to thank all the um, panelists. And it was a great honor. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I would let uh, Bhavia close. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Wow. Indeed, that was a great session and an amazing and insightful one. Thank you, Ram. Thanks, Charu. Thanks, Guru. And definitely a great moderator to curate it well, Sudesh. We have a great takeaways and the insightful ones of the great concept of future back thinking, investing in ourselves, in our families, and the Ubuntu philosophy, definitely. <laughs> I am because of what we are today. If time is money, then today you have spent millions on us. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We had great journey with you for this entire one hour session thank you thanks guru thanks everyone bye everyone thank, thank you, you everyone. Everyone.